The grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. Amen. My beloved brothers and sisters in Christ, as we gather this evening to celebrate these most sacred mysteries, we first pause calling to mind our sins. Lord Jesus, you came to reconcile us to one another and to the Father. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord Jesus, you heal the wounds of sin and division. Christ, have mercy. Christ. Christ, have mercy. Lord Jesus, you intercede for us with your Father. Lord, have mercy. Lord, Lord have mercy. May Almighty have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. And your children 
orphans. If you lend money to one of your poor neighbors among my people, you shall not act like an extortioner toward him by demanding interest from him. If you take your neighbor's cloak as a pledge, you shall return it to him before sunset, for this cloak of his is the only covering he has for his body. What else has he to sleep in? If he cries out to me, I will hear him, for I am compassionate. The word of the Lord.
When the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a scholar of the law, tested him by asking, Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and the first commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. The whole law and the prophets depend on these two commandments. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to the Lord Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Right before Mass, the deacon asked if I was preaching on the Gospel, and I told him I was focused more on the second reading this evening. And he asked me why, why I wasn't preaching on the Gospel. And I think the reason what caught to my attention this week is that as we listen to that second letter of St. Paul, or we listen to that letter of St. Paul, that it takes us back to Christian basics. Things that they needed to hear some 2,000 years ago, and things you and I, likewise, need to be reminded of. So, Christian basics. Most scholars agree that St. Paul's two letters to the Thessalonians are the oldest parts of the New Testament. So he wrote them during his second missionary journey, which was less than 20 years after the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus. And on that journey, he made his way to Europe for the very first time in the Macedonian city of Thessalonia, was his second stop along the way. And at that time, the, trip, the time that he did this trip, between 20 years after the death and resurrection, the four Gospels had not been handwritten. They were going on, or they were being trans transmitted by word of mouth or oral tradition. And although parts of them had been written down, their full versions, especially Mark and Matthews that we have today, were not fully written as we see them today in the Bible. And of course, Luke and John had even begun with theirs. In all the other letters that we have in the New Testament, Paul's other letters, that is, also had not been written. So, these inspired letters to the Thessalonians were very, very early Christian writings, perhaps some of the absolute earliest. And they raised the curtains up for the very first Christians and tells us what those people were thinking, what they were feeling, reminding them and reminding us the essentials of our faith. In this passage that we listened to proclaim in that second reading, we heard the very beginnings, it, it takes place in the very beginning, or pretty much the beginning of the first letter to the Thessalonians. And St. Paul gets right to the heart of the matter. He summarizes the most critical information that he had taught new Christians that he was briefly visiting. First, he reminds them to turn away from false idols of paganism now that they were followers of the one true God. And then secondly, he reminds them that as Christians, as we do are reminded, that we should be eagerly looking forward to the return of Jesus Christ, who will put an end to evil and injustice and lead us into that everlasting kingdom of joy and fulfillment. This, ultimately, is what Christianity is all about. Finding fulfillment not in idols that cannot truly ever satisfy, but in Christ himself, the Lord of all life, the Lord of history. Today, we can ask ourselves if this critical information is still as critical for us as it was for St. Paul when he wrote to the first Christians. I would dare say, yes. Sometimes, we, who truly are followers of Christ, restrict God's power of grace within our lives because we cling to some hidden idol, some parts within our heart or mind where we hang on to our own independence, refusing to fully trust in God. You know, in ancient times, people, so during the time of Christ, in the time, um, the first couple hundred years of the church until the end of the Christian persecutions, people still worshipped statues. So the fake idols, right? So the statues made of marble or gold, would burn incense to false gods. And one of the great saints, well, many of the early great saints, had to experience that and had to fight against that. One great saint, which we hear about frequently, is that of Saint Sebastian. 
Now, probably we're all familiar with St. Sebastian's death, and in fact, I'll mention that. But there's another story about St. Sebastian before he reached his martyrdom, a very strong story about how he fought against false idols. So, Sebastian was a Roman legionary, a member of the emperor's personal bodyguard in the end of the third century, so like 280s um, AD. And he, at that time, was a Christian. And during this time, the persecution of the emperors were often punishing and killing people for refusing to worship the false gods and the emperor. As I said, Sebastian himself was a Christian, secretly at least in the beginning, from the emperor himself. But what he would often do is visit those Christians in prison and spend time praying with them. Once, as he was praying with two imprisoned brothers and their families, the story goes, the father of these brothers was healed of a severe case of arthritis that had crippled him for many years. One of the pagan Roman judges, who also suffered from the same disease, heard of this healing and promised Sebastian that if he too could heal him, he would set those prisoners free. So what did Sebastian do? Sebastian told the judge that if he believed in Jesus Christ and allowed Sebastian to destroy all of his false idols, that he would be cured. So the judge agreed, but the judge's son wasn't totally convinced. He was very skeptical. So what he did was he forced Sebastian to make a deal with him. The judge's son, the two large fires, saying that if his father was healed, fine. But if not, Sebastian would be tossed into the fiery flames. So Sebastian agreed immediately to this and set about destroying more than 200 of the judge's false idols. But even then, once those 200 idols were destroyed, the judge had not been healed. So Sebastian went back to the judge and said to him, you're either hiding some disbelief or you're hiding some additional idols. The judge made a sign to his son who took Sebastian to a small secret chamber in the judge's house. And in this chamber were hundreds of small golden balls that were hanging from the ceiling. So what this was, it probably seems very odd to us today, but this was a fortune-telling chamber. And by lighting lanterns and reading the patterns of light reflected off the golden balls, it would cause the judge, hopefully, to see his future. Well, at least that's what he believed. So when Sebastian destroyed that hidden chamber, what happened? An angel appeared before the judge, and the judge was secured. And immediately the judge, his son, and his household were baptized and likewise became Christians. Sometimes, within our lives, we too have hidden chambers within our hearts and our soul, where we keep some hope, or desire, or fear that we haven't fully given over to God. An idol that separates us from experiencing that true freedom as followers of Christ. You know, the rest of St. Sebastian's story, Eventually, around the year 287 or 288, he decided that he had to confront the emperor about this. He was tired of these Christians being persecuted. He was tired of these Christians having to succumb to the government. So he went to them. He went to the governor. He went to the emperor and demanded that that was stopped. Well, the emperor was enraged and tied into a tree, or got him tied to a tree, and his archer shot arrows through him. Amazingly, Sebastian survived, and another saint, Saint Irene, took him back and nursed him to health. She urged him to leave once he recovered. To leave, because the emperor at this point knew that he was a Christian and knew that he wouldn't give up. But that's exactly what he did not do. He did not leave. Instead, he went back and confronted the emperor again on those issues of life, those issues of Christian um, or, or religious freedom that the Christians wish to have. Ultimately, an angry mob beat him to death, I'm sure, at the emperor's command, and he died a martyr's death. And I think that's so important for us today, especially with the upcoming election, to think of that. This man, a Roman soldier, someone that absolutely was committed to his country, or to the Roman Empire, stood up for the truth. The truth. Things like life. Things like the dignity of holy matrimony, the dignity of marriage. Things like religious liberty, religious freedom. Sebastian gave everything in order to stand up for the truth, putting aside those false idols, the idols of fear, the idols of the government, or whatnot. He put those aside for the truth, for Jesus Christ. St. Paul, in his time, poly polyistic paganism was rampant. People worshipped many false gods and goddesses and followed religions that were no more than mere superstition. In our day, 
It's a different type of idolatry, I would dare say, but even more threatening. I would call it practical atheism. Practical atheism is a worldwide view that includes believing that, that we might include believing in God. We might even attend Mass and receive the sacraments. But the practical day to day activities within our lives usually relegate God to the sidelines, just push him aside. This is as much idolatry as worshiping statues, sacrificing animals, because it seeks meaning and fulfillment where those things cannot be found, merely human achievements. This is a great temptation. It's been for, for many, many centuries in our industrial and technological age, in which we believe that science by itself can have mastery over the entire material world, will eventually, however, never have any um, any mastery over the spiritual world. We know that that's truly the case. Science can have some mastery over various things, but ultimately only God can persevere. Science can never do away with natural disasters, with war, with disease, with poverty, sin, the suffering that goes on along with them. Rather, only Christ can. Pope Benedict, in his pontificate, said, only God can create justice. Every time we read or hear, we see on our phones about earthquake, earthquakes, genocide, floods, horrible fires, terrorist attacks, it should remind us of that. In fact, one of the reasons that God commits tragedies and sufferings within the world is precisely to remind us that we are called to seek our fulfillment in Him not in our own unstable achievements. To look forward to the redemption of the world through Christ, to hope confidently in that perfect justice and happiness when Jesus will come again in judgment, as St. Paul wrote in his letter to the Thessalonians. We must never forget that life on this earth is merely a training ground for love, as the Gospel explains, and that heaven is our true homeland. As Christ shows us his love again and again in the sacraments, the sacrament of reconciliation, forgiveness of our sins, and the sacraments of the most holy Eucharist, the source of some of the Christian faith, let us ask him to help us surrender our modern idols and renew in him our hope that the one true God and Savior gives us eternal life. Saint Sebastian, patron saint of Athens. Pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Groups in our 
community. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayers. And for the sick of our community, particularly those affected by the coronavirus and those who care for them, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayers. And for the joy and peace of the faithful departed, especially Edith Oldrabina, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayers. And answer prayers in such a way.
sisters, and may sacrifice in yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice of your hands for the greatest and glory of his saints, for our good and the fallenness of the church. Look, O Lord, we pray on the offerings we make to your majesty, that whatever is done by us in your service may be directed above all to your glory, through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right to give you thanks, truly just to give you glory, Father most holy, for you are the one God, living and true, existing before all ages, abiding for all eternity, and dwelling in an unapproachable light. Yet you, who alone are good, the source of life, have made all that is, so that you might fill your creatures with blessing and bring joy to many of them by the glory of your light. And so, in your presence are countless hosts of angels who serve you day and night, and gazing upon the glory of your face, glorify you without ceasing. With them, we to confession and exaltation, we can voice every creature under heaven as we acclaim. Yeah, so. 
celebrate the memorial of our redemption, we remember Christ's death, his descent into the realm of the dead. We proclaim his resurrection and his ascension to your right hand. And as we await his coming in glory, we offer you his body and blood, the sacrifice acceptable to you, which brings salvation to the whole world. Look, O Lord, upon the sacrifice which you yourself have provided for your church, and grant in your loving kindness to all who partake of this one bread and one chalice, that gathered into one body by the Holy Spirit, you may truly become a living sacrifice in Christ to the praise of your glory. Therefore, Lord, remember now all for whom we offer this sacrifice, especially your servant Francis Arco and Michael our Bishop, the whole order of bishops, all the clergy, those who take part in this offering, those gathered here before you, your entire people, all who seek you with a sincere heart. Remember also those who have died in the peace of your Christ and all the dead whose faith you alone can know. To all of us, your children, grant to our soul, Father, that we may enter into a heavenly inheritance with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, Blessed Joseph, your spouse, her spouse, with your blessed apostles, Saint Sebastian, and saints in your kingdom, there with the whole creation, free from the corruption of sin and death, may we glorify you through Christ our Lord, through whom we bestow on the world all that is good.
I grant you the gifts of his blessing. Amen. May he for you always from every distress and confirm your hearts in his love. Amen. So that on this life's journey you may be effective in good works, rich in the gifts of hope, faith, and charity, and may come happily to eternal life. Amen. And from the intercession of, intercession of Saint Sebastian, May the blessings of Almighty God, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit come out upon you and remain with you forever. Amen.